country and you find that hardly anybody makes anything. I think of my own friends and neighbors. One of them sells insurance. One of them takes pictures for a living. One's an actor, one's a lawyer. None of them makes anything. I talk on television. I don't make anything either. This may be the most fundamental change in the country. Years ago, nearly everybody in the cities made something. Harnesses, wagon wheels, hats, violins. I've just spent a wonderful couple of days with some old guys who made something together. That's what they made. There had never been a bridge like the Golden Gate Bridge, and there had never been a job like the job of building it. The wind was, was sharp, and, and the fog was cold, or oh, cold at the bone. But there was some beautiful scenery, too. You'd, sometimes you'd be working above the fog, and it was great. And, and it was a job that was going to be one of the greatest things that ever happened. One of the wonders of the world, I guess it was. Fifty years ago, the Golden Gate Bridge wasn't here. There were serious doubts as to whether it could be put up to stay against the wild winds and tides of San Francisco Bay. Alfred Zampa was one of those who volunteered to put it up to stay. He was an aristocrat of the construction trades, an iron worker, and he got top pay in hard times, $11 a day. Hard times in depression, too. Oh, we didn't have much work, you know. Al Zampa needed that job. To get it, he had to get past the union business agent. Oh, and the B.A. says, well, it's all right. I'm going to let you go out there. You make sure you vote for Roosevelt. I says, naturally, who else am I going to vote for? <laughs> <laughs> Frenchy Gales was not an iron worker. He was a bus driver who had just lost his bus driving job and who had never been up on anything higher than his garage roof. And we used to have to go from one cage to the other on a two by 12 plank up there, five, 600 feet, no handrails or nothing on it. Believe me, you Harry. <laughs> I didn't like that. I had, I had good long toenails on my feet by the time I got through. <laughs> by the time I got through. Edward Souza was on a WPA project and looking for something that paid better. He knew building the Golden Gate Bridge also was going to be more dangerous. And it was. I guess it was a challenge of uh, myself against the bridge and, and the feeling that I had. Uh, the, only, the only time I ever got hit, well, I got hit out there. I went to, I went to the hospital for a few weeks, for a couple of weeks. I got hit and I looked up to see if anything was above me. And of course, like I say, those cells are black. I see something go by my light, hit me in the mouth and busted all my teeth out, bust my mouth. Worst of all, of course, was losing your footing up there. They said that was a ticket to hell. Unless you hit the safety net. They called that halfway to hell. It was wet and foggy, and I stepped from that beam and stepped down. If you go down straight, you wouldn't slide. And I went out too far. Slip, flip three, flipped down three times, and hit the net, and the net hit the ground at the same time. There wasn't no ground, it was rocks. Oh. How long were you in the hospital? Oh, I figured just about 12 weeks. But you know, all the time, my friends would come and see me, you know. They come and see me and give me a lot, a lot, of, a lot of bull. Says, you know, Al, you might as well start going out there selling shoestrings or something because you'll never, you're, you never make it. Your nerve's gone. You'll never get out there. So when I went out of the hospital, I didn't come here. I went right out to the bridge. I walked all over that thing. I was going to make sure. No problem. I f fell in the net once in the back span. How did but, that happen? Well, I was walking across uh, one of the cross beams, and I had a coil of wire. We were sizing the other wire with it, and of course the wind coming, I just went off backwards there and landed my tail in the thing, and I was so scared I just stood there like a gopher in a hole. <laughs> but, but you hit the net. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You know, no use lying about it. <laughs> you scared the hell out of me when I felt that fall. They all got scared, about as regularly as they got paid. The worst day of all was the day a construction platform collapsed, carried the safety net down with it, and ten men 
down with the platform and the net into the ocean. Tide was going out, and I saw one boat way out picking up two guys. One guy was alive, and he was hanging on the other guy, and the other guy was dead. He got killed in the fall, but this guy hung on to him. And then one guy, when it went down, he grabbed a hold of the, one of the iron beams on the bridge, and he hung there, you know. And uh, they dropped a rope down to him. He had no part of that rope. He just hung on to that goddamn thing. He was a little Irishman. He had a corncob pipe in his mouth, and he <laughs> didn't let that go. Finally, they took a light the journeyman rigger and they dropped him down and tied a rope around him and they, they jerked him up and he so never he was okay he's okay and he went right straight down the thing to the office and quit he had enough why didn't they all quit what kept them pulling on their coveralls and packing their lunch buckets and climbing up there into the fog every day i loved it i could bite nails then when i was a young Whew. oh it's terrific those iron workers, I think, in those days, they, didn't, they couldn't get any insurance of any kind. Lifespan was too short. Those guys lived hard, and they liked to fight. My boss used to say, Monday morning, when they walked behind you sweating, you could smell that bourbon, you know. And he said, geez, if they could only work and put a still on their shoulders, they could get another pint during the day, sweat it out. We'd shoot dice and drink and raise hell, chase women, or they'd chase us, because we had a lot of money. You know? And not many people had in those days. Oh, no. Jeez, we were like rich men. Some were killed instantly on the job. Many, many more were maimed by lead poisoning and falling steel objects. The ones who were left each night climbed up there again the next morning. Remember, these were hard times. 150 men waiting for us either to quit or fall off. Right down the bottom of the tower. You know, they, they cook beans and bacon butts in these five-gallon tins, you know? Can you believe that all that was 50 years ago? No, just like yesterday. I got my fingerprints all over, all over that iron, I'll tell you. <laughs> well, once in a while, I come across the bridge and I look at those towers and look how high they are, yeah, and see, I worked on that. I remember being up there. That's the feeling I get. It's a proud feeling. Yeah. How about you? George Black was another oh. maker of things. I'll be all we can get done with the best picture. Come here and look in the mill. <laughs> what he made were bricks. He did it with a mule hitched up to a mud mill in his backyard in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, with the sure hands and certain knowledge of a master craftsman. When we met George Black, he was 93. He made his first brick just this way, in the year 1889. Well, I've been making brick all of these years. And still we're going to make some more yet. Yes, there is. How many more sand here? George Black worked with the ancient elements. He made his whole life out of water and earth and fire. These brick we're walking on here, they was made around 35, 40 years ago. Everywhere George Black walked in his hometown, he could see the work of his hands, the bricks he made one by one for more than 80 years. We made the brick for that building right there. And then the old work done on the old home church, I made the brick for that. Then I made the brick for the library. George Black was 11 years old when his father died, and he and his brother, 14, had a talk. He said, George, he said, we're not going to get to go to school. So we're going to have to work for our living. And he said, let's learn the trades that make the most money out of work. So that's what we're going to have to do. So we're not going to get to go to school. He said, if we don't go to school, say if we, we just stand up, Hold ourselves up, make men of ourselves. If we don't know A from B, he says, we can make somebody call us Mr. Black someday. <laughs> so that's what we've done. Yeah, yeah, they oversized, what you call it. When we left Mr. Black, he gave us a brick to take along. And we still have it. It's a handsome brick, one of millions, self-made by a self-made man.